Perfect. All right. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, uh, good evening to all of you, whatever time zones you might be. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I will um, just, uh, just a quick note that um, I wanted to provide a bit of introduction uh, a bit of overview of the work that we've been doing in the uh, uh, in the broader identity and supply chain security ecosystem that specifically touches on interoperability, right? So uh, agenda is right before you. Um, you can read it faster than I can speak. So I will just uh, go right into, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, my home organization, I work for the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, it has a set of missions uh, uh, that, that tend to be pretty broad. We are an agency that was uh, brought together, and I hope this uh, this particular context actually translates across uh, borders. It was brought together as part of a shotgun wedding, um, right? So there was a whole bunch of agencies that were very disparate and disjointed, uh, who after 9-11 were brought together under one umbrella, and that umbrella was the US Department of Homeland Security. I actually work within uh, our science and technology directorate, which has two functions, which is our R&D arm and the science advisor to the department as a whole, right? So, so we do a uh, look uh, around corners to see what are the technologies, approaches, challenges that we might have and how can we sort of proactively address them more than anything else. So, so interoperability, five years ago, right? So the globally visible bright and shiny object uh, that was blockchain technologies, uh, you know, rose up on the horizon. You know, it was going to solve everything. It was going to solve world hunger. It was going to solve, uh, uh, you know, the movement of uh, goods and uh, people across, you know, jurisdictions. Um, our concern and my concern as a program manager at that time, who was focused on identity management and data privacy was, you know, there have been things that have stood the test of time, you know, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability. How does this blockchain thing support it? There are privacy principles, selective disclosure, pseudonymity um, that have stood the test of time. How does blockchain help with that? Uh, what are the architectural models around uh, bringing any type of technology into a enterprise? Uh, Particularly, what is the gain to pain ratio? Is the gain of adopting the technology actually uh, incrementally better than the pain that you will encounter in trying to integrate the technology into your environment? These were all questions that we were asking. We are a law enforcement organization, so we also had a, uh, a very uh, defined thrust under digital currencies, uh, anonymous currencies or anonymous networks, not relevant to the blockchain discussion, so I'm not going to be touching on that, right? So this was, this was sort of a starting point. Um, and what you rapidly discover when you go down the rabbit hole is 90 to 95% of the use cases that people are talking about for blockchain technologies does not require any type of blockchain. It is just basically a desire to basically play with the latest technologies by a whole bunch of people, right? So uh, where it really has some interesting value is if you actually have an environment or a problem set that requires multiple independent parties to cooperate, and you do not want any one party to actually own the infrastructure or the data associated with that, hmm then you might actually have uh, a, a blockchain case that you might want to look at. Otherwise, you just need a kick-ass dev team, a good architect that sort of understands you know, uh, hash chains and a globally distributed uh, you know, data store that you can get with a you know, Amazon or a uh, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, or name your globally distributed cloud provider of choice, right? So, we, we discovered that basically not much thought had been given to this. So we also discovered again, five years ago, a whole lot of hand waving around architecture and design. It was simply, let's just put it on the blockchain and magic will happen, right? So the other piece of, it, of that was basically every single platform vendor out there uh, wanted to be the platform operator, sit in the middle and extract value from the platform. And one of the ways that they wanted to do that is basically by in looking at the format of the data that goes on the ledger, 
Are there any standard? No. Are there any commonalities across blockchain, blockchain platforms? No. So let's basically try to lock in people using your uh, proprietary standards uh, and syntax and semantics for that data, right? So fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, race there. There was also this mystical belief uh, that you can just throw away lessons learned from the past. The ability to sort of address privacy by encrypting data on this chain. You sort of want to parse that out, right? Encryption algorithms by their very nature have a time to live, either because of Moore's law or because of often implementation mistakes and how people have actually implemented encryption algorithms in software. So they have a defined time to live. Now combine that with a blockchain or distributed ledger technology that is, that is designed to be long lived and immutable, you combine the two and really bad things happen over the long term. Things that you think are encrypted and safe become not so encrypted and safe, right? So, and that was basically being hand waved over. Uh, if you spend any time, um, as I'm sure a lot of you have, in the identity and the security space, distributed key management has been a problem, is a problem, will more than likely continue to be a problem in our community. Uh, blockchain does not make that go away in any way, shape, or form. And there was a lot of hand waving around that as well. Last but not least, um, you know, I had um, a former DARPA red team that was taking a very adversarial approach to R&D uh, when it came to smart contracts. And um, uh, there is a natural tension between the, between the expressiveness of the language that is used to express a, 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 a a, a smart contract and the and the platform that uh, and the node that it runs on and the belief that code is law when it comes to uh, blockchain co uh, smart contracts um, does not um, when you talk to lawyers that actually does not work. Uh, so five years ago, so for us, our concern was we needed to make sure that we. From a government perspective, we source our technology from the same place everybody else does, you know, the open marketplace. So for us, we were not fans of being walked into a corner and being told this is the only technology that we have. So the ability and the desire to uh, uh, ensure that there is a competitive, interoperable marketplace of solution providers that we could draw upon. Uh, was clearly important. And one of the, that was one of the rationale for basically supporting a standardized way, an interoperable way of basically going down this path. And for us, that came down to, um, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and actually supporting and championing uh, the use of uh, open standards. Um, just before they became open standards, um, I sort of remember being pitched by uh, Drummond Reed, uh, Les Chasen, who was at that time with the Respect Trust Network, uh, Manu Sponi with Digital Bazaar, and uh, Christopher Allen, uh, who was with the, who was that, with an actual company at that time, and being told about what would eventually become decentralized identifiers. So um, uh, it, it is often amusing to me to engage with a self-sovereign identity community and to convey to them that government actually funded these original specifications, then basically championed their movement into the open standardized uh, you know, environment, right? So these are things that, that we believe are critically important and um, relevant to the space. Now, standards are wonderful things. We have so many of them and you can also become very exhausted. Why do we need a new standard? Uh, I will simply provide two particular points, right? For me, uh, the, uh, as a program manager, funding what became decentralized identifiers had nothing to do with the techno-utopian dream of the self-sovereign identity. I work for a sovereign, so I tend to be semi-amused by self-sovereign approaches. Um, I, I, do, I do believe in folks having the ability to own their own data having agency and control over their systems that they operate in. For, for me, the funding, the decentralized identifier was entirely about the challenge that we face in the US around what is our social security number, which is a, an 
identifier that was created in the 1930s that was designed to basically provide an identifier for you know uh, uh, health. Uh, I'm sorry, um, financial information identifier globally visible openly shareable, which eventually became conflated with and used as an authenticator, a shared secret. So I was very interested in finding something that basically separated those two functions, separated the, you know, a, provided a meaningless but unique identifier, but does not uh, lend itself to susceptibility when it came to a knowledge-based authentication or knowledge-based verification, that it actually had a cryptographic way of doing authentication decentralized identifiers provided that mechanism. So that was the reason for our funding there. Funding for our verifiable credentials is very simple. I am, I've spent a lot of time deploying match no match services and attribute services, identity oracles in previous lives. And what you rapidly discover is that if a issuer uh, of such a service or operator of, a of such a service, if you are either malicious or curious, can actually base uh, triangulate the usage of and request for those in space and time if you choose to. The classic identity provider model, which in order to validate a credential requires a verifier to go back directly to the issuer. If you are an issuer, if you're an identity provider that is either malicious or curious, you can triangulate and geolocate that entity across space and time. That was a concern. That is the sole reason I put funding behind verifiable credentials data model. It broke that dependency. It, it broke what we call in the identity community, the phone home problem. You no longer had to go directly back to the issuer of a credential in order to basically validate the truth of that credential, right? So that's why these standards and specifications are important. We also invested pretty significantly in proof of concepts to understand do these standards and specifications actually operate at scale? Do they work? Um, the first one was basically applying these technologies to uh, authenticity of integrity of IoT data. That turned out to be a lesson in what not to do, right? So uh, we rapidly discovered that uh, if you don't, if you just blockchain it or if you just standardize it without having an architectural model around how you clearly segregate public and private data. Uh, you end up with a whole lot of bad things happening. So that was a lessons learned in what not to do. The other piece of it, particularly in the open trade space was around how do you segregate public and private data? How do you ensure that you do not share public data on any type of distributed ledger or an open chain? How do you provide standardized pointers from on-chain to off-chain? These were all lessons learned that we uh, came to. What is important about these proof of concepts in a a lot of ways is the buy-in that we got internally. This is basically the largest customs organization on the face of the planet, basically putting a stake in the ground and saying, if you are going to interoperate with us, with US customs, you will use these standards and specifications to do so that ensure interoperability globally, that ensure privacy globally, that ensure a, a level of security globally, right? So that's a big deal from our perspective in getting buy-in. Last but not least, it is important actually if you've gone through the, the R&D phase of it, all of that is R&D. Now, how do you deploy it at scale into production? And that's where you know, my program comes in. I'm the technical director of our Silicon Valley Innovation Program. Long and the short of it is we work with talented, uh, we are one of the few organizations in the US um, that actually fund startups globally. Uh, fundamentally because we do not believe that talent stops at borders. We are in the business of finding global talent to solve our local problems. And we are working with our operational part partners in order to find really innovative technologies and companies in order to address the challenge that we have. We, I, if you are interested, I'm happy to talk to you endlessly about my program. The long and the short of it is basically, we're not a grant giving program. Uh, program. We're basically uh, are in the business of putting into place uh, uh, performance-based contracts that basically mitigate the risk across the board, including up to and including red teaming of those capability to make sure that it is not just people and you're not speaking just mouthing interoperative, they're actually doing it. 
So what are the problems that, that we're trying to solve? Uh, as, a as a department, we are both issuers and verifiers of credentials. Uh, we are globally authoritative for the issuance of our uh, citizenship and immigration status for the US government. Uh, we actually provide employment eligibility for people who are neither citizens nor uh, immigrants to the US. Uh, we are obviously uh, part of uh, the department is US Customs. So if you're moving anything into our country, you basically have to provide information to US Customs uh, before uh, you obtain cargo release for moving that, those goods into the country, right? So lots of interest in uh, basically providing supply chain security as well as digitizing currently paper-based credentials. So let me let me articulate a mental model for you around those two particular large themes, right? So I see before I get to that, um, in general, you know, the scope of work that we were very much focused on is the classic, you know, uh, this is our attempt at basically modeling uh, the broader ecosystem of an issuer, verifier, holder that basically does, uh, and where the verifier does not have a direct relationship with the issuer, uh, but is going through some sort of a resilient rate registry that could be implemented using, uh, you know, any type of data store. It doesn't have to be blocked and it can be any type of resilient data store, right? So we were very clear about what we wanted. We were very clear, unlike a lot of other governments, on what we specifically wanted when it came to interoperability. We've been in the positions in the past where a vendor has uh, told us that in order to provide you a solution, you have to license their APIs. We were very clear that we wanted the APIs that were facing the issuers and the validators to be open, royalty-free, free to implement, and widely supported, right? You are free to build value-added services behind the open API, and we are happy to pay for that. But you will not lock us into a platform using licensing on the APIs. The other one is around uh, the actual use of the standards. And third and most critically, we require our companies, the eight companies that we finally ended up putting contracts into place to work out in the open. Uh, under the W3C uh, Credential Community Group and at the DIF and the other communities of interest, we require them to open. And this is, this is important. It's not just talk. I actually have um, milestones and deliverables that are payment triggers that articulate what work they contributed to the community. So they have to do this in order to basically get be paid by us, right? So. If you want people to work out in the open, you have to motivate them in order to do that. We are also interested in being transparent about what we are doing, what how it is being done, right? So mental model for us, right? Supply chain verification model. Think about it from the perspective that if you are US, US Customs and Border Protection, you have a whole bunch of entities that are moving goods into it. They might have different, very different models. They might have, you might have a steel mill, take the first one, a steel mill that basically then um, you know, has a set of attestations, then they pass it on to a, uh, a shipping uh, entity. Then they work with their customs broker. Each of those entities basically has some action that they take. And finally, they provide a set of attestations and documentation to CBP, which evaluates them and makes a decision on whether to allow that into the US. They might have large multinationals who have suppliers who are sort of front ending a lot of these things. At the end of the road, what is important to us is basically our companies are building capabilities that basically provide verification capabilities for each of these verticals. We are basically having the ability, but we want to make sure that we are actually exposing a standard set of APIs to the community so that they can integrate with them. And this is important. We are working out in the open. You will see the actual GitHub repos under the W3C. We are evolving the APIs that you will use in order to interoperate with that. We are working out in public. We are the payload, the traceability vocabulary that defines the assets that are moving through. We're working out in public. We are. We expect other people to comment on it. We expect other people to pull, pull requests against it. We are building the test suites uh, under the W3C CCG. We are building the uh, interoperability framework under the uh, W3C CCG. Everything is in the open so that people can contribute and work with us. So 
The other model, obviously, that we have is around the digital identity issuance model, right? So at the end of the road, we have um, we basically have somebody with a digital wallet that is coming to us that we are going to be using to issue credentials to them. Again, the specifics and the APIs and the vocabulary that we are using is completely being developed out in the open with full feedback. As of May of last, uh, April, May of last year, um, I require our companies to do two things to, to, to uh, demonstrate interoperability. One, they have to basically conform um, their APIs and the data models to be interoperable against a test suite that is, by the way, developed out in the open under the CCG. And because uh, test suites by themselves don't ensure interoperability, we require them to basically be part of an interoperability plug fest, an N by N multi-party interoperability plug fest. We demonstrated interoperability across these infrastructures as a start. Right, so and by and testing on the raw material import piece with all these companies where each took a different role and we were able to demonstrate um, in a cross platform interoperability cross across blockchain cross infrastructure interoperability. Same thing on the digital identity piece, different people swapping in different wallets, different issuers, different verifiers demonstrated interoperability. The long and the short of it is interoperability matters. You can't just talk about it. Um, rip and replace of technology is not a path to success, uh, especially when it comes to enterprise. So you need to uh, show a, uh, a pathway to working with existing technologies. We believe that government has a role in this in order to set a level playing field so that everybody has an opportunity uh, uh, to, 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 to do the work and participate in this work. And last but not least, I will, I'm often, we are the Department of Homeland Security. We are the US Department of Homeland Security. We may not be the first people that you think of when, it, when you have a conversation regarding interoperability. So I'm often asked, why are we uh, are doing this in the ecosystem and supporting it? I will simply note that it is a combination of self-interest and the role of government. We have priorities, as you saw, that we need to solve. There are challenges that we need to solve. We see a technical uh, need in the community to ensure that there is uh, a, a interoperability across systems and platform. And as, and, and as a public interest technologist whose day job is to work for the Department of Homeland Security, I personally believe that there is, it, it is the role of government to act in the public interest. So with that, um, I thank you for uh, for this uh, for this opportunity to give you an overview on this and turn it back over to Marlene uh, on uh, on the next steps here. Thank you very much, Anil. Um, that was really interesting and insightful. Um, so now let's do like a quick round of Q and A and see if we have any questions from the audience. Um, so I think. I cannot see any questions in the Kiko chat. So if you have questions there, feel free to put them into the Kiko chat or uh, feel free to also um, put them into the Zoom chat directly. Um, we have one comment from someone, which is not really a question. Um, Bo Harold wrote that licensing is not part of TOIP. And he's also writing that level play field for sure no lock in open source standards, global appeal, public interest equals good for society at large. Um, Harold, could you maybe put that into a question um, in, instead of the statement? I think that might be easier than Anil to comment on that. I have to confess that I was, uh, I, I really didn't quite get the, the message in this presentation. Maybe it was a little bit too speedy for me. But um, I have learned from, from learned colleagues that this trust over IP, open source, open data, uh, ready with W3C standards and ISO standards and so forth is something that um, is worth testing. And we have certainly done that here in Finland. So I was, uh, my question is that is there, is there some sort of, um, of conflict between uh, Homeland Security if it is Homeland Security that is actually preaching here and uh, trust over IP. 
So uh, given that uh, I am very familiar with Drummond um, and the folks that trust over IP, um, I, I would simply note that I think we are all working on the same set of standards and specifications, right? I think uh, trust over IP provides a, uh, a, a governance framework, and I will defer to them on describing what they bring to the table. Uh, in general, from our perspective, uh, from the Homeland Department of Homeland Security's perspective, um, we are using uh, what is important to us is that interoperability should not stop within a particular vertical or a particular technology stack, whether it is a hyperledger technology stack, whether it is a, uh, you know, some other technology stack. It should be uh, people, uh, organizations and entities who choose to deploy and use this technology should have the choice in the technology stack that they choose but they should also have the ability to interoperate across those technology stacks by providing a common foundation of security, privacy, and interoperability. So uh, in general, uh, from a philosophical perspective and from a motivation perspective, there is no conflict. Uh, and we work in the open on those specifications and standards uh, to make sure that there isn't any conflict. Great. Um, we have another question on Kiko chat coming through. Um, someone would like to hear your thoughts on data as a good and thoughts on privacy and the government role. So um, very broad question. Um, I will speak to this, what I just spoke about, right? The, the intent here is, uh, so let me, let me clearly articulate that I work for a sovereign. Right, so I tend to not get caught up in the uh, occasionally techno utopian philosophy of the self sovereign movement. Uh, having said that, we are also big believers and fundamentally believe in people having agency and control over their own data. Right, so the standards and specifications that we're talking about, whether it is verifiable credentials data model or decentralized identifiers enabled that and we fully support what that enablement technology is. As to the role of government, I defer to people much above my pay grade on the grander philosophical question. I am a lowly technologist who is just trying to solve problems. Um, we have another question actually with regards to um, government and politics. Please. Um, are you expecting that your department's priorities will remain or change with, with the change of administrations from Trump to Biden? And as I understood it before, you're not really allowed to comment on that. So uh, I am, so I will simply, I, I, will, uh, I will tap dance on that one, right? Um, <laughs> so, so at this point in time, um, President Alec Biden will be will come uh, will become our new president on January twentieth. Um, obviously, there will be a change of administration. Uh, the 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 challenges and work that we are doing is solving actual problems that uh, exist irrespective of administrations. Uh, we're solving problems around supply chain security. We are solving problems around uh, digitization of currently paper-based credentials. So uh, that, those problems do not go away. Uh, whoever, um, uh, you, whatever the new administration is. So I'm not anticipating any changes um, in going forward. Um, I would make an argument that as particularly in the, in the US, COVID-19 um, has been horrible for us. We've not done a great job with it in reacting to it, but it's also been a remarkable accelerant uh, in a lot of technologies that need to uh, be implemented in order to move to a more digital service delivery. So all of these obviously fall directly into that. So uh, I, I, I am not going to comment on the politics, but this is, we're solving problems that have existed before the current administration will more than likely exist after the next administration. So All that's right. what I can do right now. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions? Otherwise I would say um, let's move on to our panel discussion and we're gonna have another session of Q and A's after that. Ah, there is an, one more question coming through. 
Um, is healthcare data off limits in the US need to snoop into their US companies customers data? Wait, there is a verb missing here. Um, Maybe um, Fredericks, uh, who posed that question, can you uh, rephrase that question and then we can take it later on, please? All right, thank you. Um, okay, cool. Then, yeah, let's move on to our panel. And um, thank you everyone so far for your questions and thank you, Anil, for that really insightful presentation. Um, I'm now welcoming to join us on the virtual stage, Matt Privet. Um, Matt is a lawyer, writer, and programmer, and he is the president of the Radical Exchange Foundation, where he advocates for reform of the data economy. Um, before that, he has been an antitrust and consumer litigator and a law clerk at the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York. And he also advises Streamer on one of their, um, as one of their data union advisors. Um, welcome on stage, Matt. And um, if I understood that correctly, you have also prepared a little presentation for us. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Marlena. And um, uh, I think I'll give a short presentation to sort of set the stage for a bit more panel discussion, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so um, to preface um, my remarks here, um, I should say that what I'd like to do is, um, um, if I get this, all right, can you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I think what I'd, what I'd like to do is uh, take a little bit broader view of interoperability and talk a little bit more about the, in, the questions of the public interest that uh, Anil was, was alluding to and um, what interoperability means uh, for from a more of an economic uh, perspective for uh, for for consumers and other participants in the um, in the data economy. Um, so I um, I, I very much would uh, take the position that interoperability is uh, is an incredibly important and uh, and and good thing and I wholeheartedly applaud the work that uh, that Anil is doing to uh, to facilitate it and help bring it about um, but I think that it is I think it's important to uh, see that it's as something that is uh, uh, necessary but not sufficient for a uh, a, a really more uh, fair and empowering data economy um, and so I'll, I'll just, you know, briefly sort of uh, articulate, um, articulate why I think that is. So uh, my thesis here is essentially that interoperability fixes power imbalances, uh, mostly between platforms and platforms or between service providers and service providers in the, in the context of, uh, that Anil was placing it in and uh, less so between people and platforms. And uh, uh, here's why. So here's an example of, uh, of a piece of data. This is some of my data. This is a picture of me and some uh, people that I love having fun at a wedding. Um, and uh, so this is like on my phone and uh, the six other people there uh, also have this same, uh, this same piece of data. So here's a picture of the world, a, a quick sketch of the world uh, without, uh, without interoperability. So, uh, here, uh, th there's a, we've got sort of a bad old platform and a better new platform. The bad old platform has, uh, has an almost insurmountable advantage because of its larger network size. So because it has more participants and a higher density of, of data and more people locked into it, it can really do more, it can do radically more for me, for, uh, for good and for ill as a result of its, uh, of its network size um, advantage. Uh, this is so even if the uh, new platform uh, or the you know competing service provider is better in other respects. Now what interoperability, uh, oh, and I, I just wanna point out quickly that um, you, you can see I've got this sort of power uh, circle in the upper left corner of the screen there. Okay, so now it, in a world with interoperability, what happens is that um, uh, that it becomes easier for, uh, for participants on these platforms to move their data to a new competing platform. Um, and what that means is it, it gives the new platform with a smaller network size a sort of a fighting chance to compete. 
with the uh, with the old platform. So it moves the the balance of power, uh, you know, to a position more, uh, uh, you know, a more even position between the incumbents with the larger networks and the and the new competitors. Uh, which means that uh, you know the comp the the competition shifts or the competition becomes more perfect essentially because the the platforms are competing not just in terms of who has the bigger network size but in terms of who has the uh, the better offering. Okay, but what here's what interoperability doesn't solve. Here's the sort of next step that I that I think is important to to keep in mind in these conversations. So. Even if, uh, even if we have interoperability, uh, all of the platforms in a sense can still get uh, the same data from the lowest bidder, which is to say in, 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 this, in this situation, we've got, uh, you can see here are all the seven people in the picture. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe most of us decide to uh, um, give our, you know, to move our data to the new platform because we think it's better. But if, a, if, if two of them you know, stay on the old platform or whatever, then the old platform still has the same information about all of us. Um, and uh, um, uh, so there's still sort of a, uh, a, a race to the bottom that favors uh, platforms over, over, over consumers. So both platforms are actually still getting the same information um, uh, at the, at, from the person who is most willing to, uh, to, to share it. Now, um, th there's a, a further step here is coordinating decision making. Okay, so if the if the decision making between the uh, between the users of the services can be coordinated either through some sort of either through a democratic means or through uh, through an agent that is empowered to uh, to represent their interests. And they can all make a, a, a coordinated decision to move their 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 data or their identity or whatever it may be from the old platform with the larger network to the incumbent. Then uh, then the old platform has a, a lot more to lose uh, from you know uh, in in the event that its services are not as good as the as a new platform. So this like radically strengthens the hand of. Of, uh, of consumers or of users of services um, in a way that mere interoperability doesn't. And I think that this depicts a, a, a much, more, uh, much more perfect and a much more um, attractive form of competition than, uh, than interoperability alone, although uh, interoperability is a, a necessary prerequisite for it. So that's the... Um, that's a that's it for my short remarks. I, I think that you know this uh, uh, this vision of interoperability combined with sort of uh, collective decision making or shared decision making um, is you know informs the uh, the vision of the future of the data economy that um, that we are trying to to sketch out in in the Radical Exchange Foundation, um, and uh, I, I think that it's. Um, uh, yeah, it's it, it's important as we talk about interoperability. It's important to sort of, I I think always keep our eyes, uh, you know, just over the horizon and think about what what you know what uh, what we're going to need to argue for even once uh, interoperability is uh, is secured in the way that we want it to be. And uh, I'm curious to hear uh, um, Anil's thoughts and to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Matt. So um, yeah, let's start with the panel discussion. I think um, my first question to you, Matt, would be um, given that we've recently seen um, several new regulations um, around interoperability um, appearing such as the GDPR or um, uh, the CCPA in California, um, which both mention interoperability as sort of a means to um, sort of solve the issue that consumers can regain better control over their personal data. Um, but at the same time, it seems like we're still also really far away from like true interoperability. And it's even questionable whether we will ever have interoperability and whether it will even solve the problems we're facing. Um, but do you just think in general that regulators should mandate concrete interoperability standards? Or do you rather think that is something um, which will come rather through um, 
innovation and um, maybe new players and new startups and incumbents? I don't have a really firm position on whether it should be mandated. Um, I, I do think that it, uh, it can be an important part of uh, antitrust enforcement in certain situations. Uh, I think that uh, um, requiring interoperability uh, can be a good thing, although I, I just wouldn't be able to make a, the broad statement that it should always be mandated because I, I, I also worry that if it's sort of required in, in slightly wrong way, then it could you know, lock in a, uh, uh, um, uh, lock in a dynamic that, uh, that is less than perfect. So I think that that question should be approached with real caution, um, although I think it can be, um, you know, uh, in, in careful hands, something like that might be a good idea. All right, yeah. And um, Anil, you have actually, um, during your presentation, you mentioned the um, W3 concept on um, these decentralized identifiers, which help people port their data between services and which attach these specific identifiers to data, such as a social media identifier or a financial transactions identifier. And do you see them like an opportunity there that these sort of identifiers will be used in the future or for really at large that everyone at Facebook is gonna have a social media identifier attached to their data and then they can port that to a new platform or do you think that will rather remain a niche technology used for governmental services such as IDs or driver's licenses? So I'll start out at the tail end of that, right? So it's already being used outside of government a lot more than inside of government, I think, uh, in general. So I'll start there. But I, I'm, so I think I conveyed, I think, in my presentation why I actually originally funded the original, you know, thoughts around decentralized identity. It had nothing to do with uh, what we were talking about. It has basically uh, separating identifier function from an authentication function, full stop, right? It has sort of taken on a life of its own. I would also note that I think you asked the question in it, what I saw in both Matt's presentation and your question was, uh, what I personally believe is perhaps a blending of what interoperability is and what portability means, right? I, I think we sort of, in some ways, seem to be using the words interchangeably and they're not, right? So the current decentralized identifier ecosystem has the potential to um, enable an ecosystem whereby the identifiers that you choose for yourself, and it, it does not have to be one, it can be many depending on the context, one for financial, one for social media use, one for government use, one for whatever, right? You have the ability in, the, in, in there that you can take them with you. It's not there yet. Right, everything right now is sort of the decentralized identifier is now locked to either a ledger or the issuance infrastructure that issues it right now. Now, can you get to a point where that decentralized identifier is something that is truly something that you own and then you can move that from a uh, from one? I don't want to. I no longer want to call them issuance infrastructure. Maybe support infrastructure. That's one entity operates to the other. Yeah, I think th that can happen. But a whole lot more work needs to be done in order to make that happen. So uh, I fully hope and pray that happens. I I absolutely am pushing for that within the work that we are doing because I, we believe that that is really really important and critical. But I don't, I don't think we should operate under the belief that that technology is being used that way right now. It's not. Uh, where, you know, because interoperability and portability for me is, uh, interoperability is, you know, I'm probably dating myself. When those of us who had cell phones were locked to a particular cell phone provider because we got that phone number from them and we couldn't port them anywhere. That was interoperability across Vodafone and Verizon or T-Mobile. Um, portability was, I was able to take that number from one provider to the other. We're not there yet. We're not at the portability stage yet. We are still at the interoperability stage and we need to get to the portability stage. 
Matt, do you have any thoughts on that in response? No, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think interoperability is is a prerequisite for portability. So I, I was certainly taking a step back and moving a few steps ahead there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, um, you know interop interoperable standards are um, uh, you, you know almost an unalloyed good in the sense that they uh, that they that they open things up and make make better competition and better outcomes uh, uh, possible. But I, I just think that they should be, um, we should build them with an eye towards, uh, towards, towards where we want them to go. And um, yeah, maybe a question to both of you. Um, do you think that interoperability is sufficient to even ensure a competitive ecosystem of different platforms and where consumers eventually will have a choice um, and the freedom to choose the platforms they want to choose? Uh, no, but I can I, I elaborate, but I actually want to hear Matt's answer first. Well, I mean, I think my, my, my presentation, you know, uh, um, pretty much explained why I think the answer is no. Um, the, uh, you know, without, uh, um, you know, in, interoperability can enable service providers to provide complementary services in um, in a really useful way, but there are still various kinds of of market failures uh, that that can arise even when um, even when that's happening. Um, and you know, especially this is especially so in the in the context of the data economy. It's more so in the uh, it's a bigger worry with the data economy than it was in in previous um, um, previous economic contexts when we could when our you know the 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 product of our labor more or less you know couldn't so easily be uh, you know duplicated um, uh, duplicated across across platforms and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm also curious your thoughts, Anil. Thank you. Um, so uh, business, legal, technical, social, right? Uh, that's what my data is all about, right? So uh, I would simply note that, um, so there's, we've, we've all participated or been part of work in the, in the federation space around incentivizing adoption of, you know, uh, I, you know, a, a portable identities, identity providers, uh, it being able to switch uh, between them and things like that. You often um, uh, do not reach a uh, success primarily because of what uh, Matt noted in his presentation, right? The power imbalance. I, I would make an argument that in the traditional identity provider model, there is a power imbalance between um, not just uh, the, 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 the actual person who everybody else is talking about and giving lip service to uh, in that particular model, but between the relying party and the identity provider. So the relying party can choose not to accept any external credentials at all. So they, they, they have an immense amount of power. And I think this was, this was something that I think Kim Cameron, who worked on the loss of identity uh, when he was asked about the lessons learned from that experience basically articulated, I think at a previous IIW that um, you know, they didn't really think through uh, at that point in time, the immense power that a relying party could wield, right? So, so from that perspective, uh, I do think that there is a power imbalance there. Um, the, the the key with some of these standards are, are that um, you sort of need to demonstrate utility, which is. I had to demonstrate utility internally to my organization through our proof of concepts, you know, to get buy in from them that this was a viable approach. It took me two and a half years uh, to get two parts of my same organization to come to the table so that when we moved out on this path, I had both an issuer and a verifier that I did not have to play mother may I too in order to get traction around it, right? So, so uh, we are beyond that, but it requires somebody to some organization, some group of people to sort of step out and put something out there that people can argue with, change, 
and um, you know uh, uh, and implement. So uh, from a, a incentive perspective, whether it is at the business level or at the social level, it requires these architectural models to uh, demonstrate utility. And unfortunately, it's just uh, building a perfect crystal ball is not enough. We've all built perfect solutions that nobody has bought. Right? So you sort of need to provide a business model around how does this benefit the broader ecosystem while allowing value added services to be built on top of an open foundation. If you don't have that, if you don't have that value added services on top of an open foundation, you basically don't have any movement or adoption. And I think uh, that's something that technologists ignore uh, to their peril. Yeah, interesting point. Um, we also have a good question coming in from the audience re right now, which I think also fits nicely into that. Um, from Frederick Slinden, he writes, interoperability like the facts is today bad as it makes copies and increases the information overload as does many other more current systems. How do we minimize the need for copies of action of creating copies or action of creating copies? Um, that goes to both of you if you want to comment on that one. Matt, I can take it from at least one example that we have in the international trade space, right? So um, one of the uh, proof of concepts that and the architectural models that we are implementing is we don't want the data poured into our system. We want to be able to dynamically access data that, uh, that is under the control of the data owner. What I mean by that is if you're moving goods into the country and we want to, uh, you know, we, we obviously want attestations from each of the entities in the multiple hops in the supply chain so that we can sort of understand the movement of the goods and the origination of the goods and who are the entities. But if we have any questions regarding that data, what we want to do, we don't want you to, we're not requiring you to provide all the data. What we want the ability to do is if we have a question, we want to be able to go back to your system and query that query for additional information that allows us to you know, perform an action, which is either no, you're not allowed to bring that goods into the country, or yes, you are allowed to move that into there. The way that we we actually had to uh, uh, implement that in, within the context of standards and specifications. So. Originally within our environment, it, it came out to be your system will be implemented in parallel with what we call a trusted trade server that basically was operated by the entity that actually owned the data that on a bilateral basis um, and on demand CBP, our US customs had the ability to basically get access to that data, not, not pour that data into our system, get access to the data where it lies. That was a powerful enough model that we actually encouraged uh, the standardization of it. It has gone through many different namings these days. And I, I've often found in the technical community, the reason for the naming changes often tends to be that somebody wants to take credit for the new name. So that, which, which is good, there's a lot of interest. So it eventually became the encrypted data vault. Then it became the, uh, secure data store. I believe the current name du jour is confidential storage. It is a joint spec being worked jointly by the W3C uh, credential community working group and the uh, decentralized identity foundation. So that actually provides a model where you can confident, uh, you can store data, store data um, within an environment that even the storage provider does not have the ability to peek into. Only the person who actually is the data owner can get into. So if you're interested in that, and I think I see that uh, Juan just put the link to that work uh, within, the, within the chat as well, check it out. Um, that's basically where we need to go to. No, uh, on, on the identity side, um, I'm sorry, but Identity data is toxic, 
of, uh, internally for us, right? So we are deliberately going and putting into projects whereby can we, you know, I actually have a project in my portfolio that is looking at, can we uh, internally replace the collection of social security number uh, using a decentralized identifier as a mechanism going forward, right? So, so because we, we fundamentally don't want to manage the toxic asset that is PII internally within our system, right? So, um, so uh, agree with the questioner, and I, I know it's a long-winded answer. Sorry, that's me. Um, is the but that that we don't want to be in the position of owning and pouring the data into our own system. We just want access to the data at the moment of need. Um, yeah, maybe building on that, Anil, as a cybersecurity expert, um, what do you think are some of the risks interoperability is posing for consumers and their data? And how do you think can we sort of strike a balance between better control and access to our personal data whilst also maintaining security standards? So I, I'm not sure if I agree with the Marlene uh, framing of the question, right? So, 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 so let me uh, push back a tad bit and also yeah. try to answer as well, right? So um, to uh, interoperability is a starting point. It is not the end. I, I fundamentally believe that the next step obviously needs to be portability. Um, I also believe that there is a whole bunch of uh, entities, organizations, people who would like to hijack the interoperability and standards conversation um, in order to in order to basically you know sell their wares uh, to the public, right? So 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 for me, what is important is that um, if you want a common foundation of security and privacy in the platforms that you are using, you are building, you are consuming, you need to pay attention to and participate actively in where the technology is being built. Um, one of the challenges that I have with the standards organizations is that uh, there is a belief that standards are drive by. You can basically drop requirements on a standards group and basically walk away from it and magic will happen. Standards development and spec development is long, painful, and occasionally soul draining. Uh, but if you want um, actually good outcomes, you actually have to engage, you have to participate, you have to critique, and you have to engage. I personally believe that the role of government in this is one, is to ensure that no large organization or entity basically hijacks the standardization process to their benefit and ensures that there is always a level playing field between all the way from individuals to the, to the largest operators that are there. So that is precisely why we are at the standards organizations to ensure that we are one voice at the table. We also realize who we are. So our voice tends not to be ignored. So, but, but our, 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 what we speak is about ensuring that level playing field ensuring equality and equal access to those standards for everybody. So standards that are developed behind a firewall, uh, you should be running away from. Standards that are, um, are baked out in public. I, I gotta tell you, the, the comment I get from a lot of companies is, oh my God, uh, this, this, it takes too long. Guess what? It's messy when you want to get opinions from a diverse global audience and you want to incorporate that. That is part and parcel of you sort of need to buy into that. You need to sort of embrace it, lean into it, and invest in it if you want good outcomes. So interoperability is a starting point. We need to engage as a community, uh, community in order to ensure that it meets our need. But it is a starting point. The next step is portability and all the other stuff that comes from it as well. Um, Matt, one other topic I would also like to talk about and hear your comments on is um, when it comes to sort of um, the sort of abilities interoperability might afford us 
looking forward into the into the crystal ball basically um do you think that if we will ever have these type of standards um which might be attached to our personal data that this will allow us to have more collective bargaining power over our data and that this will ultimately also give users more control over their personal data um yeah so um how how should I answer that? I think the way to answer that is that I'm um, I'm not in the prediction business. You know, I, I don't I don't know, uh, uh, but I I think that um, I think that what I am what I'm arguing for in a way is the sort of policy complementarities to the um, to these conversations about interoperability and 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 portability and. Um, uh, so in, in other words, I think that what I, what in my, you know, presentation there and in my work in general, I think what I'm trying to do is, is um, argue for sort of a North star that these conversations around standards should be pointed to in my view. Right. And, and, and I think that, uh, I think that the idea of, of, uh, of collective bargaining and, you know, shared decision-making about, uh, about data is a worthy goal. I think that it's very useful to uh, to have that uh, in mind as the you know the sort of the 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 arrow that we uh, that we're that we're pointing in um, you know so I don't have a um, I'm not arguing for this standard or that standard and I can't make predictions about what will happen but uh, but I do think that if we have the uh, the the necessary standards uh, on the technical side and the necessary uh, uh, policy and regulatory support on the other side, which um, then we will be able to uh, you know there will be something like collective bargaining over over data and it'll it'll be sort of a more more felicitous data economy. So you know to be to be clear about sort of where I think the policy fits in. I think you know what I'm talking about along the lines of of um, uh, uh, shared decision making, uh, you know, through data unions or intermediaries or whatever you want to call them. To be clear, I, I believe that that needs to be facilitated by policy. I don't think that it can be done uh, through purely technical tools. Um, uh, but I, um, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, optimistic, a little worried, but also optimistic that that the uh, that the technical protocols we're building will uh, will not. Um, lock us out of that kind of a, of a possibility. Um, we have a question from the audience, which is um, building on what you've just said with regards to whether you had a chance to have a look at the Digital Governance Act here in the European Union. Um, and whether you, maybe you can expand a little bit on that and also um, with regards maybe to um, new legal developments in the US and how they sort of enhance interoperability. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the Data Governance Act um, is, is a, a, really, uh, a really positive step in the right direction. Um, I, uh, one, uh, one thing that I will say about it is, is I think that um, uh, I'm hope, I don't, I don't, again, I don't know how to play out, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the kinds of, uh, you know, sh sort of uh, shared data control, you know, uh, controlling entities that the Data Governance Act um, uh, governs and helps to bring about will enable this kind of coordinated decision-making. Um, I think that that's a more attractive um, and more promising vision for what it could do than then that these sorts of entities are are just sort of like dashboards that help in individuals make individual decisions. So I, I think a, a key distinction there has to do with rights delegation. So in other words, if I think that if if individuals are able to sort of delegate their rights up to intermediaries, that then um, that then help them make a coordinated decision about how to exert their power, for example, in the marketplace, uh, that is that will be better. Because it will it will give them more bar more bargaining power and essentially expand the menu of options that they'd be able to select from it they'd be able to negotiate for, versus a situation where they are not acting in a coordinated manner through those intermediaries. 
Um, and um, it's not totally clear to me. I think it remains to be seen um, uh, how these intermediaries will um, will shape up uh, through the through the Data Governance Act. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then there's you know yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we're also having another question in the audience, and also um, to everyone um, who's in the audience, please feel free to put your questions in there. We have about another five minutes left for the panel, so um, if you have any more questions, uh, put them in now. And um, Kalia from Identity Woman is asking about um, European engagement um, when it comes to standard setting. So Anil, would you like to respond to that question? Sure. Um, I, for those folks who are missing that question, I think Kalia asked that uh, it would be great to have more European uh, engagement in the in a traditional community group and other standards organizations. And some of the Europeans have been spoofed because DHS, US, my organization, is at the standards table, right? So what do you say to that? I'm hoping that that question, I'm glad that she asked that question. Um, so. I am a, I work for a, a public sector entity. We expect to be held accountable for what we are doing. I am expending taxpayer dollars uh, in order to basically uh, do this work. So we expect to be transparent in what we are doing. Every single artifact and standards that is that we are using, developing, uh, is actually being built out in the open. Um, every single spec that we are using is out there for anybody to comment on, put pull request against on GitHub. So uh, our test suites that we are using in order to verify conformance are being built out under the CCG. Our interoperably plug fest, uh, we've actually, uh, I sort of separated two ways. I have contractual deliverables that my companies need to deliver to us that demonstrate interoperability. So they are required to do certain things uh, as in multi-party interop testing. But we've also opened the door because we had a lot of companies come to us and said, that is really interesting. How can we test against you? We've actually opened the door and uh, uh, you know, basically had a technical exchange meeting, uh, I think uh, a month or so ago, ago, a couple of months ago that talked to how can we interoperate with you? I am unsure of if there is anything that we are doing that you feel is like behind closed doors, I don't know what is. If any of my companies that are working with us is telling you that they cannot share what they're doing, they're lying to you. Uh, they can't. Uh, I'm not working on any classified projects with them. These are open standards work. So I would absolutely encourage and uh, welcome uh, a broad global uh, community to engage in these standards processes, um, provide feedback, make changes, um, uh, hold us accountable uh, so that it is indeed meeting the uh, needs of the global you know, public rather than just uh, anybody else that is unique or government, right? So, um, want people to engage, want people to question us. That's why we are out there. So uh, help us uh, make this better. All right, so we have about two more minutes left and there's been quite some activity or like a side discussion unfolding in the chat. Um, so do we have any ah. questions here? One of them is, are we scared of the DHS <laughs> from Temu? Um, which is, obviously a rhetorical question. Uh, he's writing, I think we're convinced of Anil's passion for the open. Um, so Timu, would you like to, um, to expand on that question or statement? No, just, uh, just respecting uh, very much your passion for the, uh, for the openness. And uh, I, I don't know, I've, I've not heard of this uh, DHS uh, uh, scaredness, but uh, I certainly was curious um, ahead of this this conversation uh, um, about that. So uh, in some way, in some way, no wonder. But I hadn't heard of it being explicitly said, uh, um, like uh, like Kalia phrased it. 
So I'll simply note that I have more challenges internally making the argument. Gov so it's not just a DHS thing, right? It's a, it's a government thing. And I would make an argument that it is not unique to a US government. It is unique to governments in general. We are more used to uh, basically uh, articulating all of our requirements uh, from the beginning and having vendors built to it, right? We're not it, it is not a comfort zone for government folks in order to actually be operating in the, uh, you know, a collaboration standards, which is, uh, shall we say, uh, as um, um, I do not know if the term drama queens translates uh, globally. Uh, but uh, if people thought that drama queens and drama kings existed only in the movies, they have not encountered the technical community, obviously. So, so we, you know, so, so it is always fun to engage with the technical community and to have a robust discussion that basically, you know, gets us to a good outcome that actually everybody can benefit from. So I would welcome um, um, whether it is, uh, uh, whether it's adversarial engagement or constructive engagement. Engagement is engagement. We can, we can deal with both. All right, we're coming to the end of this session now. I think that's a nice way of closing it. Um, thank you everyone who joined us today. And also thank you everyone else who is gonna be watching that maybe later on because that session has been recorded. Um, I would just like to remind everyone, um, there's gonna be another session coming up in 45 minutes with my colleague Shiv Malik. He is gonna have a fireside chat together with MIT's professor Sandy Pentland. Um, so that's also definitely going to be an interesting one. So make sure to stick around for that. And um, also tomorrow, there is going to be a bunch of workshops happening. I'm going to give a workshop together with my colleague, Matthew Fontana at 4 p.m. British time. So um, feel free to join us there. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, thanks everyone for, for joining us here and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a nice evening or a day or wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.